everyone much for all sticking with us throughout the day. Our last video is going to be a mix of talking videos and an Ask the Doc forum. So I'm going to toss it over to Sandy to introduce our last two speakers, Dr. Benny Kersner and Dr. Ian Leibowitz. Hi, Sandy Buckhorn is here, Executive Director of Global Autoimmune Institute. So happy to be here. Our first speaker in this session is Dr. Benny Kersner. He is a board certified pediatric gastroenterologist with more than 30 years of experience. In addition to his medical and surgical expertise, he has experience with basic and clinical research. He has been listed as one of Washingtonians magazine's top doctors since 1985. Must, he has a lot of fans. <laughs> Dr. Kersner established the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at Children's National Health System. He has traveled to South Africa to examine nutritional issues and further investigate his interest of feeding disorders in children. He currently serves as Medical Director for the Celiac Disease Program at Children's National Hospital. And our second <clears throat> speaker is Dr. Ian Leibowitz. Dr. Ian Leibowitz is the Chief of Gastroenterology at Children's National Hospital. He is an elected counselor to the Executive Committee of the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. That's also known as NASFIGAN. He's a member of the Strategic Council and Physicians Leadership Group with Improved Care Now, a national collaborative that has created a community of clinicians and researchers that measures outcomes and develops best clinical standards. Through his work as a highly accomplished pediatric gastroenterologist and his proactive approach to induce remissions from those suffering from Crohn's disease <clears throat> and ulcer ulcerative colitis, <laughs> Dr. Leibowitz leads a team of nationally recognized education research leaders and specialists to transform clinical care for children by enhancing the patient experience within the hospital. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Sandy. Yes, thank you, Sandy. Uh, Sandy, just one correction. Dr. Leibowitz is gonna kick off and I will follow. Oh, very well. <laughs> thank you. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. Vanessa, is everybody seeing the screen? We do not see your screen yet. Okay, that's not what I wanted to hear. Why are they not sharing my screen? Yes? Yep, you're good. Okay. So uh, first, I want to thank uh, Vanessa and Sandy especially, but all the organizers for inviting Dr. Kurzer and I to participate in this afternoon. Uh, I especially want to thank them for giving us the unenviable task of closing the day on a beautiful Sunday afternoon when virtually everybody probably wants to be outside. And I suspect many, many are taking this uh, opportunity to both be outside and perhaps to listen to us talk. Um, Dr. Kurzer and I are going to try and uh, walk everybody through the history of uh, the diagnosis of celiac disease um, from uh, before World War II up to the current uh, methods of diagnosis during this COVID pandemic, which interestingly, I think is adjusting the way that we approach celiac disease and perhaps uh, for the going forward in the future, it'll help us get to a, a, a simpler way of working it up in a more consistent way. So our objectives basically are we're gonna just demonstrate the access to the intestine. I'm actually gonna try and show some short videos of what it looks like when we're actually doing these studies. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through some of the fancier tests that we do for diagnosing celiac disease in complex situations. And Dr. Kersner is gonna walk us through the uh, underpinnings of the evolving immunologic and the antibody testing and the way we're using those testing now to supplement and perhaps even to replace some of the more invasive methodologies. So the history of, the, of, of celiac disease uh, is, is complex, as everybody knows. It was probably first described by the Greeks thousands of years ago. Um, it was recognized several times over the course of history uh, and really diagnosed by Samuel G., who both Dr. Kersner and I are proud to say is a pediatrician. Many of the other physicians uh, were adult medicine physicians. Um, and there was a history uh, to the diagnosis of celiac disease. Uh, after Dr. G. recognized that it was probably dietary related, uh, and dietary manipulation might help. 
Um, we went through several phases, including things like the, the banana diet, which was uh, found to be helpful for many patients, although they didn't really understand why. And that sort of goes back to the 1920s uh, era. During World War II, uh, there was a significant uh, interest in uh, this disease. And a, one, a Dutch physician was the first person to really make the observation, and I think to really confirm that the diagnosis was related to sensitivity to gluten in grains. Um, before World War II and in the Dutch population, there had been a significant mortality rate related to celiac disease. And remarkably, during World War II, that dropped to almost zero. And it wasn't until after or late in the war when we started airdropping bread and other foods to the civilians that they started seeing it rise again. And the incidence, especially in children, was noted. And Dr. Dickey, and a, a Dutch physician, was the first to make that connection. And he and his colleagues wrote a series of papers that seemed to help define the etiology of the disease as related to wheat. Uh, the difference being, of course, that lacking wheat and other grains during uh, the World War II uh, and all the terrible situation that went on there, they were making flour out of potatoes or other poorer grains that did not uh, seem to cause celiac disease. So that was the first real understanding of the relationship with wheat to uh, the mortality morbidity of celiac disease. And so it came to be that we had to avoid wheat. And then we went through a series of how do we make this diagnosis? Um, obviously, diet trials were the first things that were done, and really we're showing this just to, to point out the sort of the troubles with doing dietary trials. First of all, they're not very specific, and as I mentioned, the banana trial, um, people for a while believed that bananas would cure celiac disease, and while a banana diet did help many, many patients, it never really explained what the pathogenesis or pathophysiology of celiac disease was, and even now, when you look at the many, many people who are on gluten-free diets, the vast majority of them do not have celiac disease. Um, somewhere in the range of 92% of our population probably doesn't have any issues with gluten at all. There's a 1% risk of allergy and a few percent risk of what's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And somewhere in the range of one to one and a half percent of people will actually have celiac disease. And the message here really is the message that everybody I think on this call probably already recognizes that going gluten-free, whether it's on a banana diet or a potato diet or any other kind of diet, is really not helpful in defining this and really should be avoided because this is a complex disease with a lifelong commitment. And as new discoveries come on board, the diagnosis will be even more important if we're gonna qualify for either trials and or diagnostic therapies for celiac disease. So the next phase in diagnosing it after the early trials of just diet manipulation were suction biopsies. And suction biopsies started around the 1950s. Dr. Margot Schreiner was the first person to actually do a biopsy in a child. And she was able to be the first person to describe the mucosal injury associated with celiac disease. Uh, this became more pronounced or easier to do procedure when Dr. Crosby and the colleague uh, developed the suction capsule biopsy, uh, which was a little capsule that was attached to a long tube that could be swallowed. And when this was down into the small intestine, they could then apply suction through this tube, which would pull the mucosa into this tube. And when they applied the suction, it also triggered a small little knife inside the capsule to just take a superficial bite of the mucosa and allowed people for the first time to be looking at biopsies of the small intestine in patients who had celiac disease. And what you can see here, Dr. Crosby, who was in the United States military, these are the first pictures of the capsule. And on the far right are the pictures of what mucosal biopsies look like normally. This picture to the, on the left half of that, the image and the flattened surface of the small intestine in somebody with celiac disease. Now in fairness, I would have to admit, I have never ever done a Crosby capsule biopsy, but we do happen to have an expert in Crosby capsules with us today. And so I might invite Dr. Kersner to share just a few minutes with us about what it was like at the very beginnings of getting tissue to look at small intestine and celiac disease. Benny, you want to join us? Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I, I must first say, th uh, and before I go on, I also want to extend my thanks to Vanessa, to Sandy, and all of those involved in this meeting. It really is terrific, and truly, I feel honored to join it. Um, I, I got thrust into celiac disease because I went to see my boss, and told him I want to be a cardiologist. And he said, no, you're not, you're a gastroenterologist. I was an attending, young attending then, and he took out of his drawer 
that Crosby capsule and handed it to me and said, go and learn to use it. And uh, it was an interesting experience. You had to pass it through the mouth, go to the radiology department and sort of shove it all the way down into the duodenum with the child not really asleep. But the wonderful thing about that capsule, and you can see it here, is that the biopsies you obtained were superb. They were relatively large, sort of about a quarter of an inch or so in diameter. You could flatten them out on a piece of blotting paper and cut the mucosa beautifully. And you got the kind of picture you're seeing here with the villi beautifully displayed and the crypts on the right side beautifully displayed once you had the biopsy. As we will discuss later, Although it was an inconvenient method, and we are so much better now at getting tissue, we don't get those kinds of results anymore. Um, and so in some ways, it's sad to see that Crosby capsule disappear. And uh, in other ways, I'm sure the kids are a whole lot happier this way around. Thanks, Ayn. Thank you. Um, Crosby capsules uh, fell out of favor, if you will, in the uh, 1980s. Um, as better technology started to evolve. Um, it, it, as Dr. Kersner points out, was not a very patient-friendly procedure, although the suction and knife approach did allow us to get a really good biopsy of the small intestine. There was, however, this long list of differential considerations that were back then and continue to this day of when you get small bowel biopsies. Um, back in the time when these were being done more often, things like kwashiorkor, giardiasis, uh, some of these others uh, were very common. Truthfully, anti-enterocyte antibodies weren't even recognized back then, near was, nor was alpha-chain disease, and Crohn's disease was still thought to be rare in children. Um, but the Crosby capsule was the beginning of our ability to look at tissue to help differentiate celiac disease from other malabsorptive disorders, which was the typical patient who came to have an evaluation. Endoscopy has a long history as well. Uh, people have been trying to develop imaging for internal evaluation for several hundred years. And the first scopes, which were rigid metal scopes, were actually uh, used in the late 1800s. Uh, Dr. Kussmaul over in Germany actually developed a metal tube with a light on it that he first practiced on a sword swallower who could swallow not only swords, but apparently this large gastric scope that he developed uh, back in the 1880s. None of these were really practical uh, for use for what we're talking about, and they really didn't become practical until uh, the 1950s when the first gastric cameras developed. These gastric cameras were rigid scopes that could be placed down the straight esophagus into the stomach and could allow them to take pictures of the stomach, um, but that was as far as it got. It wasn't until the late 1960s that the first flexible scopes developed and there has been progression since that time. By the 1980s, we were starting to do scopes on children. Um, it followed the 1970s doing it in uh, adults. And uh, in the 1990s to 2000s, we started developing the technology to do uh, video endoscopy. When I trained, which is not the capsule era, but near fo that followed that, the first scopes were actually almost like microscopes where you had to have an eyepiece that you held your eye to now, after around the 1990s, they developed video scopes that could be showing the pictures up on the screen, which were far better. And this is, in essence, what a scope does. It's a flexible fiber optic tube that goes down through the mouth, into the stomach, and through the small intestine. Um, the pictures on this scope on the far upper left corner show a normal-looking stomach. The far right is an esophagus. And then as we go further down, we see uh, some of the abnormalities that one can see in either the stomach or the esophagus. Endoscopic findings in celiac disease have been described over the years. On the left side, again, what we see is a classic normal small intestine, which is this beautiful, smooth, rounded, what are called plique or folds of the small intestine. These extend down throughout the entire small intestine, although they look different in different areas. Uh, some of the first findings you can see would be the nodularity that's seen in the very beginning of this. And then the scalloping is the classic finding. The scalloping sort of like the tips of a scallop shell uh, where you see these little ridges uh, in the small intestine. And while these are beautiful pictures, uh, it doesn't always look quite as simple and clear 
as this when you're looking through a scope. But here's a, a video of, of a scope that I'd like to show. And I, I thought we'd just give you a, a few seconds of this. Um, gastroenterologists love doing endoscopy, as everybody knows. And so we can spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes down looking at somebody's small intestine. But I thought just I'd give you a few seconds to see what it looks like. And so this is the actual scope. And there one can see the, the pattern of the mu mucosa. There's the little bit of uh, what we'd call scalloping or nodularity of the folds. This pattern of the mucosa that you can see here is what's thought of as a mosaic or reticular pattern of the mucosa. It's also a classic finding of celiac disease. And so this would be the small intestine, and this is what we're looking at when we're looking through a scope. When people ask us and we come out to talk to parents, what do we think? Um, we're able to tell them to some extent what we saw visually and whether it really looks like celiac disease or not. In some of the cases, it's as simple where you see this kind of nodularity and this kind of scalloping. You can be pretty sure that this is going to be celiac disease. Not too many other things look like this. And after a couple of minutes, what we do is there's a routine. We will go down into the second to third portion of the small intestine. Here's another beautiful picture of scalloping of the folds. And the magnification of this has gotten so much better over the years. Uh, it's really hard for me to describe to what it used to look like. Um, so we take routinely a series of six biopsies, three uh, sets of two biopsies in different parts of the small intestine. And the reason for that is that this picture shows that there's areas of the small intestine that are most commonly affected. The duodenum is where we take biopsies and the routine for us is to take two sets of biopsies in the second or third portion of the small intestine, that being at the parts of the curve. And we'll generally take one at the junction of the stomach and the small intestine called the duodenal bulb. You do hear about cases where even though the patient has the right clinical picture, the right antibodies, the right tests, the biopsy doesn't show anything. And that is because while this first part is usually affected, it can be affected to varying degrees and at times, it can be further down in the small intestine that celiac disease is really presenting. And the endoscope can really only go through the first portion of the small intestine called the duodenum. If the disease is hiding further down, that's where sometimes there can be a miss rate. And in adults, these areas further down in the duodenum are frequently the source of failure of therapy. Luckily, in the late 1990s, there was advancing technology, and this is what's called a video capsule. It's about the size of a large pill, a vitamin, if you will, um, about eight millimeters in length. It can be swallowed by most kids over the age of 10. Um, we can put it down with an endoscope down to about two years of age, 18 months in some studies, and it will traverse through the small intestine. Inside the capsule is a little camera and a battery and a transmitter. The battery will last for about eight hours. It transmits two pictures per second to a receiver that either the child can carry on their belt, almost like a fancy cell phone, or a parent can throw over their shoulder if it's a little child. And the receiver will receive these. These can then be printed out on a, any computer that has reading software. The pill camera also gives really good pictures. Uh, the pill camera was developed in the 1990s. It was first approved by the CDC around 2003 and has had progressive increasing utilization for a variety of diagnoses, although celiac disease is not the most common diagnosis. However, if you look at these pictures, what we see are the same kinds of patterns that we'll see uh, through the endoscope. Picture four so shows the scalloping of the folds. Picture six shows that mosaic or reticular pattern. You can see that again a little bit closer in picture seven. Um, and these are the kinds of findings that we would see when we're looking th through this. Now, a capsule will tape up to eight hours of video. And so where an endoscopy takes 10 to 15 minutes, uh, when we review these, we're actually reading through many, many hours of videotape of these pictures. Um, easy for the patient in many respects, a little more time consuming for the physicians. And not every physician who does endoscopy does video capsules. So sometimes there's a time lag for getting the results. It is however, particularly useful in cases uh, where there's either resistance disease, complicated disease, or for some reason, a patient can't have an endoscopy or doesn't want to have an endoscopy and biopsies. And we're not comfortable enough just using serology in that particular patient. I thought again, I might try and give you just a, 
a little view of what it looks like when you're actually looking through the capsule. Um, right now, you can't steer the capsule, nor can you take biopsies through it, although both of those opportunities are coming. There have been evolving what are called steerable capsules using a variety of technologies. And there's even now in the works a, bio, a capsule which will have the ability to not only be steered, but to take biopsies through it. So again, it's a little harder to see, I think, in a video capsule, which is just repeated images. But there is, a, and I'll try and show you some of this, you can frequently see the same, here's a good example. This is that same from up close with the camera of the scalloping of the folds. Uh, the in microscopic imaging is incredible. Again, you can see right up close and personal the scalloping. These should be really smooth. Instead, you see this notching or ridging of the folds. And in various places, as uh, the, the capsule moves down through the small intestine, and you'll see it, it moves with little bits of fluid. Um, some of the pictures will unfortunately get little bits of food mixed in with it. Um, we try and keep the patient's NPO for the morning before doing it, just like we do for an endoscopy. Um, sometimes we'll give a little bit of a clean out before we do this with Miralax to really try and move things through the gut so that by the time we get it down there, we're able to really see the mucosa. And again, it, you can see the sort of very abnormal scalloping of this. And you may have to trust me. Here's a picture of that reticular pattern of the small intestine, that same sort of uh, mosaic pattern to the mucosa. Um, and when you see this, we pretty much know that this is celiac disease. So again, after a study, we're able to tell people within some degree of predictability that this is in fact celiac disease, although up to now we have been unable to take biopsies. So this is an enhanced technology. You can use different kinds of light through the scope and the video capsules are now being produced with different kinds of photo opportunities, including different light sources, much like the endoscopes. And this may be even more sensitive for celiac disease and showing the mucosal abnormalities. So in the future, again, probably limited indications, but an opportunity to get further down the road with these kinds of technologies. There are patients who do struggle with celiac disease, and this is more frequently seen in adults than it is in children. Um, in refractory celiac disease, sometimes the changes are just distal, but you start seeing changes that almost look like Crohn's disease, which are ulcerated, inflammatory, usually in the jejunum, or what we call jejunitis. Um, and these are complex cases, sometimes best seen uh, by a video capsule. So I, I wanna change speeds here a, a little bit and just talk about a couple of other testing that's sometimes done uh, for celiac disease. We don't generally do MRIs of the intestine uh, for celiac disease, but occasionally there's a concern enough to go ahead and do it. And this would be a case where a patient was non-responsive, claimed to be a, you know, doing a diet pretty well. And uh, they had a full workup, including an upper endoscopy originally, which had shown celiac disease. Um, and on MRI, what we're seeing over on the far left are the very pronounced folds that usually you can't see um, in, an, in a patient as easily with celiac disease. And so there was this very abnormal fold pattern that was consistent with uh, celiac disease. You can now use uh, what's called enteroscopy to get a scope down well below uh, where we used to. There are different kinds. There's a single balloon and double balloon scopes that can get down to these areas of the small intestine, but it's harder in young children. It's a much longer procedure. The anesthesia is longer and it's only done when really, really necessary. And the last part that I wanted to talk about before turning it over to Dr. Kersner is I wanted to touch base on one of the other questions that frequently comes up. Um, and this is some very interesting new research looking on whether there really is a way to define the effects or impacts of gluten sensitivity or celiac disease on the brain. And we all know that lots and lots of patients have complaints ranging from headaches or migraines to uh, brain fog, to lack of concentration, um, a host of neurologic uh, kinds of problems. There's a well-described ataxia syndrome where people lose their balance. Um, and people have started to try and look at this using what are called functional MRIs. And functional MRIs are ways of looking at sort of blood flow during an MRI. And I'm not gonna ask you to, to recognize all each of these and the abnormalities in them because I probably can't. But what they're being able to show us is that in patients who have certain symptoms, and this is an, a fibromyalgia patient, another one of those syndromes that's really hard to define, um, they were able to show changes 
in the MRI, in the functioning white matter of the MRI, in the functioning part of your brain, um, with a gluten-free diet over time. There have been similar studies uh, for the last oh, almost 15 years now, looking at uh, MRIs and CAT scans in children and adults. Uh, first studies back around 2000, 2003, uh, looking at adults. And what they find, again, are some abnormalities in the white matter, and sometimes in specific areas, and even sometimes loss of white matter in patients who have a variety of symptoms. The most classic is the patients with ataxia who have a, a loss of parts of their cerebellum, the part of the brain that sits at the brain stem that's very responsible for things like coordination. This is another kind of thing that the NIH is doing, looking at the effects of alcohol on the brain. And similar studies have been done looking at celiac disease. And the point of this is that newer technologies are allowing us to find things about this disease that we know as celiac disease that previously we may have suspected or people may have even scoffed at or doubted, um, but that are really able to be defined by using these highly technical things like uh, the newer fancy functional MRIs. I think at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kersner, who's gonna try and walk us through the more pragmatic and more evolving phases of diagnosis around serology. And I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, um, thanks, I. Here we are. Okay, thank you. So I want to just pick up what's under the surface. Uh, Ian has beautifully illustrated what our amazing ability is now to look at the surface of the intestine and gauge what's going on. But the truth is that the surface only helps us when it's obvious, and all too often it's not obvious. And getting beneath the surface is what's necessary. Uh, Moreover, until we got beneath the surface, we couldn't work out what the chemistry of this problem was. And not knowing the chemistry, we never had tests that allowed us to screen for celiac disease without doing biopsies. So in the past, we were stuck by doing a biopsy when we suspected the disease, having to repeat one once we were gluten-free, having to repeat one again when gluten was in there. And we had to wait to get to know the chemistry before we really began to make progress as a profession. So let's look at that serology more carefully. Um, I'm happy to say that in my very early career as a fellow, I got a real insight because I worked with a group who was doing work on viral enteritis. And what was found there at the time that human rotavirus was discovered was that the virus was invading the surface of the intestine. The surface of the intestine looks like this with these beautiful villi. In the course of the infection, those disappeared. And the reason was that the body was actually getting rid of them, getting rid of them because they're being loaded with virus. And in this way, securing a healthy mucosa which could be regenerated. And the original mucosa had surface cells which had microvilli on top of these villi. So when you spread all of this out, you had a surface area the size of a tennis court. Whereas if you spread this out, there were minimal microvilli and the surface was maybe as big as a ping pong table. Surely there was going to be a lot of absorptive problems, but it went beyond that. These immature cells needed time to gather energy, and become what they were to be. Now, with viral enteritis, by the time the virus was eliminated, you could then reestablish the mucosa. What if the injury was wheat and it was mistaken for a virus? Then we would have a progressive state which wouldn't recover. And the way things looked was more like this. You started off with these beautiful villi covered with very tall, beautiful enterocytes being manufactured in this crypt down here. Then as injury occurred, the manufacturing section had to grow while the crypt disappeared. And ultimately you wound up 
with very deep crypts and nothing on top and a major inflammatory response in the lining of the intestine. Now, if you look at celiac disease, it's clear that it follows precisely the same progression, that these beautiful villi with their surface enterocytes are ultimately lost. We begin to see the elongation of these crypts and we wind up with this surface and this major inflammatory response, which unfortunately does not confine itself to the intestine. So you not only lose the ability to absorb, but you're also going to have an inflammation throughout the body doing all sorts of weird things like brain fog, bone density problems, and so on. Well, what, how does this all happen? Now, you, you've heard many talks about this and you've seen beautiful presentations and uh, you've had a lot of nomenclature that gets thrown in. Now, quite frankly, I think the scientists are phenomenal, but linguistics in science sort of follows a progression which is quite illogical and very often hard to understand this. So I took a put upon myself to try and simplify this and explain it in a way that we can all understand. And it begins over here. You see, a wall has been built. But that wall happens to be in the intestine. It is this lining, this incredible lining over here, which allows for legal entry of substances that we want to absorb and keeps out of the intestine or out of the body those things that we don't want, unless there's an injury. Now, covering the surface, we have a mucus layer, and in that mucus layer, we have the microbiome, a bunch of bacteria, which help protect the surface. If we disturb that surface, we change those bacteria. If it's invaded by a virus, such as Coxsackie, we're going to destroy this protective device, and things are going to get through. But... Keeping guard on the other side is something like the National Guard, and that we call the innate immune system. It's sitting over there all the time, ready to take on the invader. And as you heard before lunch, very important is the first step. There are cells there, demonstrated by this guy, who vet what's coming through, who recognize whether this is good for you or bad for you. And if it's a virus, have the ability to convey that message and deliver it to a messenger who will go off and get the rest of the immune system to come in there and take care of it. Let's look at that more closely. So in the handling of gliadin, the breakdown product of gluten, we see that it is the central piece and it's got a covering and that comes through into the intestine. Now, the tolerance of that is inhibited, as you heard today. And as a result, the message can now go forward that there's a problem coming. The gliadin gets deaminated. And notice, tissue transglutaminase gets involved here, taking the surface off that gliadin molecule and releasing something that is interpreted as toxic in some individuals. It gets passed on by this guy over here who happens to have the DQ2 and DQ8 gene, which allows for the passage of this molecule to the messenger. Now, if you don't have DQ2 and you don't have DQ8, you can't pass it on and you will not get the celiac reaction. But if you do have it, it does get passed on. And that sends a message out to the adaptive immune response, which is like calling in the military. And these lymphocytes are the soldiers that come in and what they do is hone in on the surface where the virus is coming through and where it's multiplying. They rid you of that surface Unfortunately, you keep getting more of that wheat coming back in. So you keep getting rid of the surface. 
and gradually and progressively the inflammatory process accelerates, the mucosa is lost, and we don't have absorption. Now let's look at that in more traditional ways. So if we have gluten, we develop a leaky junction, the gluten comes in and transglutaminase takes care of it by and deaminates it. The deaminated gliadin is then passed on, provided you have the HLA and HLA DQ2 and DQ8, provided you have the genes that make it possible for this antigen presenting cell to send that message to T cells. And notice these T cells now set off chemicals called cytokines that have destructive power. They also hearken B cells, which develop antibodies, which also can have protective or destructive ability. Now notice the antibodies here are important to us, Glyden antibodies. We're amongst the very first that were discovered to be present in celiac patients and allowed us by looking for them to screen for the disease. Endomesial antibodies are thought to be liberated as, indeed are liberated as well. And of course, this tissue transglutaminase antibody, that transglutaminase busy over there gets an antibody against it. And levels of that have become one of the major means of dealing with this condition. And ultimately, we have the lymphocytes now in amongst the enterocytes, causing the destruction, leading to the villus atrophy and the um, injury we know so well. So we can recognize some important names in this process. The deamination accounts for deaminated glyden IgG peptide. This is a molecule we look for. It's been said to be more useful in very young children because they might have a delay in the development of tissue transglutaminase. It is also very useful because it's an IgG type molecule in those individuals who have IgA deficiency. In other words, who aren't able to make the IgA anti-tissue transglutaminase that we so depend on. And that is not a rare condition and carries a slightly higher incidence of celiac disease, but it's kind of difficult to find there. If we go on and we look at the, the gene, HLA, DQ2, DQ8, we've now learned to look at that. If we look at the total population, we know that 40% of that population carries that gene. If we then look further, 1% of the total population, more or less, have the disease, which is only about 3% of those who carry the gene. It's clear then that while the gene helps us exclude those who do not have the ability to get celiac disease, it doesn't take us very much further to the person who actually has it. For that, we need more specific antibodies and antibodies to look at. So, and indeed, we now have those. Those Glyden antibodies prove to be insensitive. We don't use them anymore. Endomesial antibodies are considered to be pretty specific. If you have them, you're thought to have mucosal injury. And the tissue transglutaminase is most sensitive and the test for it remains at the root of our screening for celiac disease. A word on that that I think is important. It's a tricky test, as we'll go through and, and discuss a little later. But recently, it's been improved. And taking a lesson from Zika infections, isn't it weird that these viruses indirectly help us? We've learned a method to do testing at the point of entry of the patient. That sort of testing will mean that in the future, we should be able to test for tissue transglutaminase in the doctor's office, get a result right there, and have a far more effective means of screening for celiac disease, a very important advance. 
Uh, what about serology? It's gotten a bit of a bad name in the beginning, and there were reasons for it. It's a simple stress test. I send your blood to different labs and I get back very different results. And that was very true, particularly in the United States, where the disease was not standardized, and a lot of different labs were developing different techniques with different reliability. In truth, things have improved, and maybe the bad reputation that it got in the beginning is not quite so deserved now. But it also has other problems, false positives, transient or persistent elevations that are not due to celiac disease can also occur. Infections, particularly in people who have autoimmune disease, might lead to low grade or moderate increases in tissue transglutaminase. And when you track it in the normal population, there are those who develop it and then it disappears. So relying on it alone has been somewhat uh, irritating, let's put it that way. Thirdly, the return to normal of that tissue transglutaminase does not parallel the progression of the disease. People who have very high values at the outset continue to have high values, and it can be a year or even two before it returns back into the normal range. So maybe for those reasons, to begin with, um, in 12, in 2012, when, we, when the North American Society laid out criteria for the diagnosis of celiac disease, they very much encouraged the use of anti-tissue transglutaminase as a screen. And in young children, they said, maybe we should be adding the deamidated antiglidin antibody. But they insisted that we have biopsies of the duodenal bulb and descending duodenum to confirm the diagnosis. So no biopsy remained a goal, but we weren't there yet because serology was not standardized and results were somewhat inconsistent from the chemistry. We recognized that this was a lifelong condition. You couldn't afford to make a mistake. And more recently, we also realized that we may need baseline evaluations to compare against in the future if the child, or the, certainly the adult, was not doing as well as anticipated. Moreover, as biopsies were done routinely, we discovered that some patients had H. pylori, we weren't expecting that, and we've had about 9% of the patients with ears and ophylic esophagitis, um, a potentially uh, dangerous condition in some. And of course, the biopsies or the endoscopies would also discover coincidental peptic ulcer problems or reflux problems. So we had a good many reasons to say, let's continue with the biopsy. But the biopsy, in fact, got a better reputation than it might have deserved. You know, people like to talk of biopsy as the gold standard. Well, just look at this. On the left is the kind of biopsy you would get with suction capsules. On the right is all too frequently the kind of biopsies one might see from a pinch biopsy. So it takes good technique and a superb pathologist who's very well versed in the interpretation of biopsies to get results that warrant the gold standard reputation. I've always thought at best this is copper. But put together with the serology, we got great results. And how you cut the tissue also has problems. You see, when you laid out the flat little piece of tissue from the suction biopsy, you could cut it so that you cut down the length of the villi. When you get this little ball out of a pinch biopsy and you cut it, you may very frequently cut along a trajectory that gives you a false impression. The crypts look like glands. The surface looks a little uh, shorter than it might be. And it takes a good pathologist with careful technique to read it and also to insist that the tissue be recut so that they get an angle to look at that yields a result that's reliable. So the Europeans had developed a somewhat different approach, 
then at the same time that we came out with our criteria, they said in symptomatic children, you know, you definitely want positive histology and positive anti-tissue transglutaminase unless the anti-tissue transglutaminase is greater than 10 times normal. They predicted or claimed that with a value that high, the chances of you not having celiac disease were pretty remote and felt that it was adequate to just stop right there. In the asymptomatic child at risk, they felt positive histology was a, a, a necessary and preferably they also like to have um, gene testing done to make sure that this child actually had the potential to get celiac disease. Now, these two approaches have come under further discussion, and I'm not going to go through all the details of that, but some years have gone by. And in recent times, the Europeans have come out with follow-up studies and elaborate analysis of their population which suggests that having a value greater than 10 times normal is indeed a very strong positive predictor of celiac disease. Um, and this has influenced our thinking recently. Uh, here we are in the midst of the COVID epidemic uh, or pandemic, and we got together with our colleagues throughout the country and reviewed what we should be doing right now at a time when endoscopy is a little more challenging. We don't want to use the endoscopy suite willy-nilly. We're keeping it for very serious cases. We're worried about PPE. Uh, in fact, virtually throughout the whole country, while we are in shutdown, you can't get a biopsy. So, more or less, and this is a summary of our thoughts, if one has a high tissue transglutaminase greater than 10, regardless of symptoms, we follow the ESPGAN guidelines and we would call it celiac disease. With the next blood draw, it might be nice to get an endomesial antibody and repeat the tissue transglutaminase, but in fact, many are skeptical about that need as well. It's ironic that Ivor Hill, who wrote the original um, 2012 directive on our approach to celiac disease in the North American society has himself become much more skeptical about the need for additional blood work once it is 10 times greater than normal. In the symptomatic child, we start the gluten-free diet without any genetic testing. In an asymptomatic individual, there's a case-by-case -case consideration until definitive testing could be considered if one really wants it. But that depends on discussion with the family and weighing up the pros and cons as I've outlined them up to now. Much more difficult when you have a moderately high tissue transglutaminase, one that's less than 10 times the upper limit of normal. There you want to watch and wait on a gluten-containing diet if they're asymptomatic but you're certainly going to go on to a gluten-free diet if they're troubled. You might consider genetic testing just to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And uh, if the illness uh, has features that require additional investigation, such as inflammatory markers, of course you would do that. But if you're symptomatic, we propose starting the gluten-free diet at this time. If, the, if you have mild elevation of the tissue transglutaminase, false positives are far more common. And this is really challenging. And you want to consider the case, you know, case by case, think it through carefully uh, and review and consider whether you can wait or not. If you decide to start on the celiac gluten-free diet, you warn them that at a later point, there's certainly going to be a gluten challenge. If you have a high suspicion of celiac disease and tissue transglutaminase and the peptide are negative, 
celiac disease is still possible, and obviously it would be a good idea to consult a celiac specialist. And let me just point this out. We've been doing telemedicine interviews now for some weeks. And uh, you started this lecture by seeing how a tragedy, the Second World War, could also have a silver lining, notably emergence of the fact that wheat was causing celiac disease. I happen to believe that this is another silver lining coming out of a tragic time. For two years, we've been trying to perfect telemedicine. Only now, in two weeks, did we get it worked out. And here's a result that I saw published saying 84% of patients prefer this approach. So I have no doubt that when we come through the epidemic, and we will, we will come through, but we will think very carefully about the testing we're doing. And we may, I suspect, find that many more patients are reluctant to have biopsies. And we will have to have face-to-face, -face, careful discussion about the pros and cons. <coughs> what about the future? What's coming down the road? Well, science is providing us with some excellent opportunities. One of the most frustrating issues is to have a patient already on a gluten free diet where suspicion of the disease remains and you haven't sorted it out. Are there going to be ways to prove it? Well, there are a number of indications that we can. With biopsies, we'll be able to demonstrate, it seems, that you can have lymphocytes induced to occur within four hours of starting a gluten challenge. Just look at that. And let's go a little further. You remember that we had this diagram with cytokines being released over there uh, in the pathogenesis. Amongst those cytokines are a number that can be carefully looked for. Amongst them, IL-2, interleukin-2. And in this study, we see that within four hours again, looking at blood levels of interleukin-2, shown here in red, you can get a dramatic increase, even in patients who have been on a gluten-free diet. So we may be, be able to do a we may soon be able to do a challenge and within hours tell you whether you have the disease and not put patients through the protracted six to eight week gluten containing diet to get those answers. And here's another approach that I think is really exciting. Um, the tetramer is used in order to identify the T cells that characterize celiac disease. Let me take you back to explain that. You remember, I'm sorry. You remember that there was this guy who was handing the gliadin molecule over to the messengers to take out to get the military. Well, imagine you could make this guy with four arms and that he could connect to four of these fellows. And if you could count the number of these fellows that are there within four hours of giving a gluten containing meal, we'd be able to assess whether they're celiac disease. And indeed, the results show that you certainly can. Well, with that, thank you. I'd like to take questions and then maybe you can go out and with appropriate distancing, enjoy the other good things in life. Thank you, Benny and Ian. That was excellent. And we actually have quite a number of questions for you guys that have come in. So we're going to jump right in. Um, the first comes from Rachel. Thank you for doing all of this. Um, a question for the panel. I always heard the explanation as the villi got flattened, but here Dr. Leibowitz is saying the celiac example is more scalloped and rough. Can you explain? Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'll start. Okay, you, you know, 
please realize that those villi are microscopic. When we're looking at them through an endoscope, you might see them if you spray a little water in and you occasionally, if they're very well formed, you see them float up into the water. But far more often than not, you cannot see them at all. And what you're seeing is gross changes in the surface, which gives you that scalloping or palisading. And you're not, it's, that's why the biopsy is so much more effective in analyzing the result. This question is from Connie. Is there a reason for a person who has been biopsy diagnosed to get genetic testing so as to inform other family members of possible health issues? Well, I, I actually think that there's very little reason to do that. And let me go back to that little diagram that I had. 40% of the population carries the gene only 3% of those people get the disease. Now, if it's in your family, it may go higher. Some people will say as high as 10%. I've seen very different numbers. But that still means the vast majority don't have it, don't have the disease, even though they have the gene. So you compound the confusion. You get the gene result. You now say you not only have the gene, but maybe you really have the disease, but we haven't proven it. On the other hand, if you do the serology and it's suggestive, you've got a very good reason to be concerned. So I think the gene only helps if you've got someone and you're not sure what's going on and they are on a gluten-free diet, for instance, and they had symptoms that could have been celiac disease, but they could have irritable bowel syndrome. And you say to them, let's do the genes because if it comes back negative, I can assure you, you don't have celiac disease. But if it comes back positive, we're gonna to have to work harder to get a diagnosis. Yeah, I might add, I think the, the only situations where most of us would feel the genetics is really valuable is if you have perhaps a young family and one child gets diagnosed and you are lucky enough to test the children for genetics and you get that they carry none of the genes, then you can be pretty sure that those other children will not get celiac disease. Whereas we don't really have good recommendations for screening those children year after year, every time they get a stomach ache or they get some diarrhea. And so in terms of you know, relieving the anxiety that almost certainly goes with having one child who has celiac disease if you have other children, if they're lucky enough to have none of the genes, that situation occasionally is valuable to the family. So we have a lot of questions about the capsule endoscopy. Um, this one is from Blair. Is the capsule endoscopy a way to monitor recovery for celiac patients? Should we do this to make sure our guts have healed? Um, so, you know, what Dr. Kersner said up front, I think is still the most valuable. Um, if you look at the data, the biopsy is still the diagnostic test. The video capsule is really not a test for MARSH-1 or MARSH-2 types of diagnoses. And as such, it's not really sensitive enough to be able to tell if the mucosa is healing, because as the mucosa heals, it's going to look more like a, from a Marsh 3 or 4 to a Marsh 2 to a Marsh 1 to a 0. And so you really can't follow using it. It's really a test that right now, its main purpose is complex diagnosis. Those patients who want diagnosis and theoretically can't have uh, an endoscopy for some reason. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I I, I, I had said it, and I think there's a consensus that the place for the capsule endoscopy is predominantly in the elderly person who's not doing well for two reasons. One is it's the elderly who get the resistant form of celiac disease, so-called type 2, which has a lot of potential complications. We virtually never see that in childhood. There are one or two reported cases, but, but they when they reported, you know, it's I think I've seen two reports in, in I don't know how many years. So, and, and frankly, we also need to be aware of cost and we have to be aware of effort and concern for this to become a routine test at this stage. We just don't have a, enough information. I would add two things if I can. As the capsule evolves, when it can take biopsies under directed vision, you know, directed circumstance, sure. it may become more valuable. 
And if the new optical uh, enhancements become more valuable, that may be helpful as well. The other thing that I should point out is that in adult world, it is being used to look for intestinal lymphoma in the right situations in the risk of celiac disease. Still an extraordinarily rare thing and almost never seen in pediatrics, but in the adult world, capsule does have a role looking deep into the small intestine for those kinds of complications. Absolutely. So this is just a follow-up to what you guys just said. Can the capsule endoscopy be used during the time of COVID so we don't have to wait longer to do the endoscopy in the hospital? So one of the advantages of capsule endoscopy is that, in fact, it doesn't require anesthesia for most patients, especially adolescents, older children, and adults. Um, it can be done as an outpatient, um, so it does have certain advantages. Uh, it is not as definitive as a biopsy might be, um, but I think as we come with serologies, there may be a role for defining these kinds of uh, utilizations in special situations. Uh, Dr. Kersner is not wrong. It is, uh, as it currently stands, expensive technology, but by avoiding anesthesia and avoiding the operating room, it's probably actually less expensive than doing the standard upper endoscopy. It won't, of course, compare to just doing blood testing. There's a question someone would like you to explain uh, what the mucosa is. They're, they're not quite sure what that means. Be your pardon? Uh, someone has asked, uh, what does mucosa mean? Oh, okay. Uh, the mucosa is the surface lining of the intestine. Uh, it generally includes the epithelium, so the, the surface, the very surface cells. And underneath that, there is a sort of spongy tissue that contains a lot of white blood cells and inflammatory cells and blood vessels and that sits on top of a thin layer of muscle. So when we take a biopsy, that's, that, that's sort of flexible and comes up into the biopsy device and leaves behind the muscle layer, the deeper muscle layer. Uh, so that's what I think of as mucosa. Now, it also exists in other areas of our body. I mean, the skin is keratinized and sort of dry and heavy, but everything from your your mouth to your conjunctivi and other areas of your body, which I won't go into in detail, are, are mucosae. All right, for our next question, uh, my child is a patient of Dr. Kersner. I'd love to know more about whether scoping again is a good idea and also when people should restart gluten challenges. I'm eager for my younger daughter to be tested. Well, um, first of all, please call me and let's discuss it in detail. <laughs> I'm, and I'm eager to speak to you, I promise. But, um, you know, the, the rebiopsy requires uh, specific indications. I don't think we do rebiopsy in the vast majority of patients unless things evolve to a point where there's a specific need. So it's hard to answer that question in, as a general, general Sorry, um, Benny, this family has an older child already diagnosed with celiac and they would like to test their younger child. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood yeah. you. No, the, the, the rule of thumb is you do the test after there's been adequate exposure to gluten. And generally you need at least a year of exposure. And as a general rule, if the child's asymptomatic, you wait until age three and you get, the, you get the blood work done then. Now, if prior to that, let's say somewhere between two and three, you're having blood done for whatever reason, I would strongly encourage the test to be done, provided there's been an adequate period of exposure. Great. There are some questions uh, about the symptoms of celiac disease. So um, one asks, what are some of the symptoms or what are the various symptoms? Another asks, can it can celiac disease stunt growth? Another is, does celiac affect cognitive abilities for, for children, including or in particular for children with disabilities? Complicated question because the, uh, from the original pictures of celiac disease, which were the child with failure to thrive, a distended belly, uh, diarrhea, we have learned that the spectrum of celiac disease is, is incredibly vast. Um, and so, in, in today's world, there's very few things that are not potentially part of the symptoms of celiac disease, although we tend to think primarily of them as gastrointestinal related. 
That having been said, growth and linear, both linear growth and weight gain are certainly part of gastrointestinal symptoms. So the answer to the question about growth is absolutely, it's a cardinal symptom of celiac disease. Cognitive things are much more difficult to define, but I think there's fairly good in, in growing data that says a variety of neurologic kinds of complications are associated with celiac disease, ranging from symptoms like headache to more identifiable abnormalities of neurologic function like ataxia. Uh, and there's a fair amount of data looking at some of the, the cognitive function questions. There are some tests that have been shown, um, such as some repeated uh, active tests that do seem to be abnormal in celiac patients with abnormal MRIs associated with them. Um, there are also, uh, you know, an increased number of patients who have attention deficit disorder, depression, and anxiety associated with celiac disease as well. Um, the exact subpopulation of developmentally challenged children, I think, is a, is a much tougher question that I'm not sure we have a lot of definitive answers for, but I'd be interested in what Dr. Kirzner thinks as well. Uh, well, firstly, I, I must say this, Sandy, we thank you for supporting us in our pursuit of just that question. And uh, in the data that we've gathered, uh, we have found, you know, Shana has shown this very beautifully, that ADHD and anxiety are clearly more prevalent in our population of celiac children than they are in the general population. This is not an e easy thing to sort out. Uh, I wish it were. And what we're lacking is a direct test that could tell us this is gluten-related occurrence. Because, not surprisingly, given the other constraints that are imposed on these children, uh, there are reasons for emotional upset, there might be reason for even cognitive delay, uh, that are not necessarily ascribed to the disease itself, but to the surrounding epiphenomena that go with it the need for the diet, what's happening at school, do I get to school, what am, what's it? You know, there's so many additional issues that have to be resolved. And frankly, we haven't looked at it that closely. Uh, we're just beginning to scratch the surface, I think. I, for one, who has been interested in this illness for a long time, have to confess that only when I got to know the people in our group did I recognize just how much headaches are part of this illness, and they very definitely are. Uh, why it is, what that means, you know, what the pathogenesis is, these are all important questions that truly need to be answered and warrant the research money that's being put into this area. I do think we should add, Benny, if we, if we might, Vanessa, that yeah. the things like the school age guidance that's going on and the efforts to alleviate some of the anxiety and concern and to normalize life for these children as much as possible, whether it's toasters or Play-Doh, um, I think those will have an enormous help, not only in helping us define whether it's truly disease related or the epiphenomenon, but also in just making these kids' lives better. Absolutely. So good for you guys. Thanks. <laughs> so the next question is from Katie. If you did not vomit on gluten before diagnosis, but now do with accidental exposure, is that still likely to be caused by celiac? Or as someone once told me, that's indicative of a wheat allergy? Or in general, is it common for symptoms to change before and after going gluten-free? Should I go there? Uh, okay. It is surprising, and I think I was mentioned this morning, uh, before lunch, that people who go gluten-free on a re-exposure often have uh, more of a reaction, though it might not be long-lived or long-lived. So, but the results are very, very variable. Um, one of the first uh, a, a studies I was associated with as a student was on, in a group of children who in the days before serology, we challenged and then re biopsied them, and we took a group of known celiacs, put them onto gluten, and followed them, and biopsied them when they became symptomatic. A good proportion of them soon became symptomatic, but by the end of the year, we had a large number of children who had no symptoms at all. We biopsied every one of those, and every one of those had the mucosal lesion. And it demonstrated to me that the range of reactions is very wide. There is something called a celiac crisis, which fortunately we see very rarely. 
but I have seen, and we've had one case in the last two years, where someone who is entirely gluten-free and then has a substantial gluten diet uh, or intake and becomes horribly ill uh, and needing hospitalization. So you've got a, an enormous range of possibilities. Very good. I think we have time for one more question. So uh, let's see, Virginia asks, to what extent do the, do the villi heal when a patient is on the gluten-free diet and do they ever return to normal? Well, uh, the answer is they can return completely to normal. Uh, but not always. And uh, there, there has been defined, particularly in adults, some immune changes that don't appear to be entirely turned around. In pediatrics, what's missing is a study that looks longitudinally and repeatedly biopsies. And I know that that's being done uh, right now up in Boston uh, by one group. And it's an important study. You, you know, they, right from very early in life, have taken a, a sample of, a large sample of children, looked at them genetically, looked at them in many ways, biopsied them at diagnosis and intent to re-biopsy them and develop enough data to answer that question comprehensively. If we base it on what we know about adults, there is a subpopulation of patients who appear not to heal completely. Now, why? Is it because they're having minimal exposure that's very hard to pick up? And now with the gluten peptide that we can find in stool and urine, uh, we frequently find people are being more exposed than they should, than they, they expect. Or is it an innate issue? Again, research questions that I think still need serious answers. I, I would add one quick point. I mean, we do have studies years ago when uh, we didn't talk about this today, but before we had serologies and some of our knowledge, the criteria, what were called the interlocking criteria for diagnosing celiac disease required not only that you do a biopsy and show that they had this villus injury or a flat villus lesion, but that you then put them on a gluten-free diet and re-biopsy them and prove that they have healed. And then you re-challenge them and prove that they once again developed the same injury. And then when you take gluten away, you re-biopsy them and prove that it heals. So we do have some studies from you know, the 1970s and such when we we're using these criteria that did show that the vast majority of especially children do heal and heal completely to the point that they were willing to make a confirmatory diagnosis. We of course don't go through that process anymore of multiple biopsies for a variety of reasons. Thank you both so much. Um, I want everyone to know the questions that we haven't answered yet, we will make sure that they get answered and posted on the website. And um, there have been several notes to both Dr. Leibowitz and Dr. Kersner from um, patients of yours that you diagnosed years ago, um, from parents of your patients, all who are so thrilled that you were with us today and um, are sending many, many kind words of thanks to you. So we'll make sure to pass those all on to, to them as well so that they will see your notes. And thank you to everyone who has texted me pictures throughout the day of yourselves and your children watching. Um, I have loved getting all of those. Um, it's been very joyful to see them since we're not all together. So I just wanna say thank you again to all of our speakers for taking the time to be with us and educate our community today. You are all incredible. And we are just so grateful for your dedication to improving all of our lives. Um, as I mentioned earlier, all of the sessions were recorded and will be available later in the week on the Global Autoimmune Web Institute's website. And we will send you all a link to those videos as soon as they're posted. Um, just a few more quick thank yous. Um, a huge thank you to our Children's National Conference Services team for helping us with the technology, to Shadon and Brandy, we could not have done this without you, um, to Kate Raver and Joanna McMahon for all of their hard work with planning, again to Sandy and the Global Autoimmune Institute, and to our entire Celiac Program Advisory Board. Um, we're just so grateful to have all of you supporting us all the time. And last but certainly not least, thank you to all of our attendees who stuck with us throughout the entire day. Uh, we are so glad that you joined us. And if you have any additional questions, you can reach out to us anytime at celiac at childrensnational.org. We truly hope that you all enjoy the rest of your Sunday and get outside for some sunshine. Bye, everyone. <laughs>